Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Duchess Marmet. We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Stephanie and I had such an amazing experience last week. We went to Healing Elements Yoga and Massage Studio in St. Anthony Park, which is really on the cusp of um, St. Paul in Minneapolis. And we went there and we took just a wonderful yoga class. We each had our you know, own massages. I had like an integrated massage, which I've never had before. And the therapist was so wonderful. What, what did you have? I had a deep tissue and I was had so much inflammation going on in my body. It was wonderful, wonderful. Probably one of the best massages I've had. Um, it's such a welcoming community too, Marnie. Like we sat before our massage and yoga class and we had tea. They have like a little, you know, tea coffee shop area and retail space. Which had the cutest little things. Like I could just spend time kind of browsing around in there. Yes. And um, it was just, it's such an authentic place. Like you really could feel that welcoming community and um, just inclusiveness and connectedness really and they have so many different services they offer they have all different kinds of yoga classes meditation classes massage therapy they're doing workshops and special events and you can actually sign up to be a have like a massage membership so if you are someone that which is so cool yes so healing elements has an amazing offer for all of our listeners First-time customers can receive a one week of unlimited yoga classes for free and $15 off a massage treatment. Head on over to our show notes and you'll get the promo code. You can either book online or you can call the studio. I cannot wait to go back. Neither can I. Hello and welcome to episode 22 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Today our guest is Melissa Rappaport Schiffman. She is the founder of Green Intention LLC, where she writes, speaks, and consults for healthier and more sustainable homes and workplaces. As a LEED accredited professional, she has led the LEED certification of several million square feet of commercial property. She is currently the editor-in-chief of buildwithrise.com, an online resource that helps homeowners make healthier, more sustainable decisions for all of their home improvement projects. She's the author of Building a Sustainable Home, Practical Green Design Choices for Your Health, Wealth, and Soul. She holds her MBA and MA in Public Policy from the University of Chicago, and she lives in Minneapolis with her husband and her two daughters. I met Lissy through one of her daughters, actually. Our girls became um, good friends in junior high, and we got to know one another. I think we actually went out to lunch kind of the first time we got together. And I remember at the time Lissy was writing her book and she was working on a lot of big um, lead projects with companies and I think some maybe nonprofit organizations. And I was just so impressed with everything she was doing and how much knowledge she had in her field. And I was really excited to learn so much more about building a sustainable home and all the different things that go into it because I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I loved hearing about it and learning about it. And I have her book. Her book is great. I highly recommend getting it. Anyway, without further ado, here's our guest, Lissy Rappaport Schiffman. Hey, Lissy, I'm so excited to have you here today, and um, I would love for you to tell us more about your background. I know that you're involved in building healthier and more sustainable homes, and we'd love to hear how you got into that. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. 
Um, I got into sustainable homes and sustainable buildings um, as a sort of a transition. My background is around finance and public policy. And I was really interested in making our own home more sustainable and healthy. And what I mean by that um, from a sustainability standpoint is there's really several areas around sustainability and it means more energy efficient, more water efficient, healthier indoor air quality, healthy landscape. All of these things kind of tie together to make our homes and our earth really healthier for humans. 10 years ago, we had the opportunity to build our own home. And we were really concerned about having a healthy home. The home that we had purchased, um, we actually didn't intend to build our own home, but we bought a home that had a really moldy basement. And I'm really allergic to mold. And nobody uh, is, <laughs> it's, mold isn't healthy for anybody. Right. And I really didn't want my two daughters exposed to it. And we couldn't really figure out how to make the home a healthy home without mold, without actually starting over. So, in 2007 or 8, we started designing a new home, and I learned a lot about what really affects your health. And it's not just mold. It's a lot of things that can off-gas and affect the air quality, and it can affect your respiratory system. And so for me, that was my main entree into what green buildings and sustainable, sustainable homes and buildings really meant because of my own experience of being really allergic to mold and not being able to breathe in buildings that, you know, have mildew, mildew and mold. And you started a company around that, right? Yeah. So I, because of my finance background, I had worked um, in corporate finance for a while and I really wanted to help corporations, organizations, nonprofits with their own sustainability strategy because I could sort of speak the corporate lingo. So we, when we built our own home, the LEED rating system had just come out for homes. LEED is an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's a holistic green building rating system that really lays out best practices for building more sustainably. And so we had the opportunity to LEED certify our own home. I really wanted to understand what are the costs and benefits here. So I did that with our own home. I became a LEED accredited professional because I loved what the system laid out. It was just very holistic. It looks at energy and water and healthy indoor air quality. It looks at landscape and it also looks at the materials and the resources that you bring into your home and how they affect, you know, waste and the transportation of the materials and sort of everything that affects the health and wellness of our planet and how that can affect humans' health. So were your builders LEED certified as well? So no, um, buildings get LEED certified, people get LEED accredited. Or so were they <laughs> accredited? Our builders um, and our architects, they were not LEED accredited. It was still fairly new. There weren't that many LEED accredited professionals out there yet uh, 10 years ago, but they were really interested in finding out more about this rating system. And they felt like it was a great way to learn more about it and also kind of have a feather in their cap that, hey, we built this LEED certified home. So then how did you, if you didn't have a builder who necessarily had done this before, how was the process? I mean, were you sort of leading the charge in all of it or? Yeah, so the process, if anybody out there has built a home or renovated a home, you know the process is not an easy one. Right. right. There are millions of decisions that you have to make and you sort of have to be on top of your builder and your subcontractor with every single one of the decisions. Otherwise, things just get made for you and you don't really know what's going on in your house. So I did a ton of research. I have a huge library of green home building, Prescriptions for a Healthy Home was a great book that I read early on. Um, green Building for Dummies is even a great book. Um, but what I found with all of the guidebooks is that they just throw everything at you and there weren't a lot of honest stories about there about what's really worth it, mm -hmm. what are the real costs and benefits, because every decision is a trade-off. There isn't really one definition of a sustainable home. Mm -hmm. Things are just more or less <clears throat> sustainable compared to something else. And what we compare it to is the standard home built to code. Mm -hmm. 
So with every decision, you say, is this going to cost me more? What is the benefit? Is it a long-term benefit? Does it make my home more durable? Will I have less maintenance? And there's so many decisions that you need to make. The lead rating system lays out a lot of it, but you still have to do a lot of research about what do you care about? Does it fit within your budget? And so you have to make all these decisions about, well, I don't care about, you know, say, wood that's harvested from a sustainably managed forest because, you know, it just, it costs more. And I would rather put more money into, say, an efficient, you know, ground source heat pump that is going to save me money year after year. So I'm just curious, did this get all the way down to like paint and VOCs in, you know, I know there's like the paint can off gas and carpet and how deep did you go? Yeah, that's a great question. There are so many different decisions. We were very on top of the carpeting and carpet pads, flooring, paint, kind of the bigger decisions. Uh -huh. What I could not stay on top of was the caulking. Oh um, my gosh. The wow. sealants, kind of all the smaller yeah. tubes right. that all of the yeah. subcontractors have. And that was just too much because yeah. you also, you're dealing with people in the field who are working with you know, products that they've worked with over time. And they might argue with you and say, I'm not switching. This is what works. Right. And so there were some give and takes on that. I mean, we used, uh, uh, we have wood framed windows. And so I didn't want a solvent based sealant because of the off gassing and, you know, the respiratory illness that it can cause. It can cause eye irritation. It can cause headaches. So we had a water based finish on our windows. And I went over there um, to the house while it was being built and I asked, the guys who were in you know painting on the sealant and I said how does this stuff work you know does it work well for you and he said well this is the first time I've ever used it I don't know how well it works but it's nice to not go home every day with heartburn and I thought wow, wow it gives you heartburn so I mean I was almost in tears thinking about all of these different materials that these workers are exposed, are exposed to yes. every single day. Mm -hmm. So I was very on top of like the paints and some of the sealants that were bigger. I just couldn't go all the way down to right. some of the smaller ones. Um, well and that kind of leads right into air quality, right? So tell us a little bit about air quality in the home and out of the home. Yeah, so what a lot of people don't realize is that indoor air quality can be three to five times worse than outdoor air quality. The EPA has said that, and it's because of so many things that can off-gas in your house. A lot of people don't realize that formaldehyde is a product that is used in almost everything in the house, um, from engineered woods to cabinetry, flooring. Um, it's sort of a preservative that... Um, you know, binds with other agents. I don't really know the technical details of it, but it is not a great chemical. It can cause respiratory illness mm -hmm. and headaches and, and sleepiness cancer, and it cancer. Causes cancer. Yeah, so we had to be really clear on um, specifying non-added urea formaldehyde cabinetry, and we only found one cabinet maker at the time who even knew what I was talking about. Oh, wow. And you think that's because of where we live? Like, we're in the state of Minnesota. Did you find in your research when you're looking at other houses that certain states are a little bit like California, more ahead? Yeah, I feel that's like they I was have thinking. more, you know, vendors or whatever manufacturers right. that absolutely. Know what you're talking about. So California and actually Southern California, which a lot of people think Northern California is more progressive yeah. and in a way I was it Northern is. California. But because LA, Los Angeles, used to have some of the worst air quality right. in the country. There is um, there there are a lot of rules and regulations that came out of you know, a horrible time in L.A. to make their air quality better, and a lot of it was related to you know um, things that off gas and you know make the air quality kind of disgusting mm -hmm. <laughs> and not not good for people. And even still, it hasn't gotten a lot better. There was just an article in the paper that said that people that live in L.A. are going to live on average one year less because of the air quality wow. there outside. So, but you That's spend crazy. crazy here in Minnesota, we spend most of our time indoors. <laughs> and so you really got to look at your indoor air quality. So some of it is, you know, what just off gases from, you know, it can be shower curtains or um, shades or blinds, flooring, cabinetry, but it's also what you bring into the house. So mm -hmm. your cleaning supplies, 
um, any type of your furnishings, all of those things can affect your, your air quality. And then you also need to look at your mechanical system. Um, most new homes have, you know, central air and are you filtering that air? And is it, you know, going through a filter that is actually going to pull out some of the things that can um, cause coughing, you know, respiratory illnesses. Okay. So it's Just, almost like new houses can be worse in some ways. Like they, a new house that's not, you know, LEED certified mm -hmm. or like that's not... They can be. You know, being built in the way that you're describing, you're getting a lot of off-gassing all over the home for yeah. a long time, right? Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the materials can off-gas for a while. And um, also because energy code has, been, has become more strict, the houses are tighter. So older so homes, is right, so the air can be trapped. worse because it's trapped unless you have a good mechanical system and you make sure that, you know, there's airflow that's actually working to make your air quality better. So that's a key component. Like there's a, a passive house principles that I didn't know about at the time, but had I known, I, we would have built a passive house. But it makes a really tight, really energy efficient home. You can save 70 to 80 percent of your energy bills by doing a passive home, but you have to have a really good mechanical system to filter your air or your indoor air quality is gonna get pretty bad. Yeah, I was gonna ask, so one, I guess what this passive house means a little bit, but two, what can someone do to look at their air filtration system and- Like, is there a way to there... test your air quality? There are different air quality um, monitors out there. It depends on what you're looking for. There's a lot of different gadgets and things. Um, a lot of people, there's people that specialize in mold. Um, there's one, I talk a little bit in my book about testing for radon, um, mm -hmm. which is odorless and, yeah, right. you know, but very hard. That is uh, the second leading cause of lung cancer. Um, but so you have to really look and see what kind of testing do you want. Right. Okay. And so you mentioned your book a little bit, and maybe we want to briefly mention that as just another, as a resource, right? And yeah, so I actually started talking about kind of the other guidebooks that, you know, throw everything at you, but didn't really get to the true costs and benefits and didn't have a story. And so that made me want to write a book about building a more sustainable home. And I thought so much about what does that really mean to me? Like sustainability isn't a word that people really understand and can get behind. You know, it's just sort of big picture like yeah we'd like to have a more sustainable world what are we doing that's not sustainable you know it's it's kind of overwhelming and so i thought a lot about well what why w did we have a more sustainable home and why am i helping people and i really came up with three reasons for your health for your wealth because you save money when you save energy and water and then the third one is for your soul and the soul piece is an interesting piece because it's sort of a catch-all category of things that might not have an immediate impact on your health or might not have, it might, they might not save you money, but they make a difference for the health of our planet. Things like materials that may be recycled or reclaimed. So you're not mining or harvesting mm -hmm. more, you know, materials mm -hmm. out of the earth than needed. So you just sort of feel better about those things. I mean, people recycle because they feel good about doing it. They're not saving money. It's not really better for their health, but we do it because we're just trying to make a small difference in this world. Right. So it gets to kind of the moral side and the moral imperative of what are we doing to our earth for our future generations. And so when I talk about sustainability, it's, you know, the planet will be here. Mm -hmm. It's more about the ability of future generations to continue to thrive and have access to clean air and clean water. It's mm -hmm. really that basic. And your book really dives into specifics, and right? Yes, it goes through it. So there, that was, that became the framework for my book, Practical Green Design Choices for Your Health, Wealth, and Soul. That became the framework for my book, Building a Sustainable Home, Practical Green Design Choices for Your Health, Wealth, and Soul. So the three main chapters of the book are for your health, for your wealth, and for your soul. And then within each one of those, there are three sort of topics and strategies that you can use to enhance your health, enhance your wealth, and feel good about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. I mean, it's a beautiful book. And it's, so it's really, it's a resource for people out there that are looking to maybe incorporate more sustainable sustainability into their homes. And it's really a, it's a how-to book, right? So you could take your book and there's resources in there that people can reach out to. 
Yes, it is. A one, it, kind of a one-stop shop, right? Yeah, it is kind of a one-stop shop. It's it's a how-to. I wouldn't say it covers every single thing in there. Some of our reviews are, mm-hmm. you know, like she didn't go into appliances more in more depth. But that's because it is, that's a whole you know, I go through <laughs> landscaping, <laughs> right. you know, um, you materials, only... waste, um, you know, durability, right. water efficiency, all of that. So um, it is kind of a how-to guide. And what I'm what I have heard from readers is that it has really helped them prioritize and really helped them kind of match their values to their decisions in their own home. Right. Because mm-hmm. I truly believe that change begins at home. We spend so much of our time at home. Our homes are probably our biggest investment. Mm-hmm. So have your values match what you have in your home. And then you can sort of pick and choose and prioritize. Because I think people get overwhelmed by the number of choices. And we also get overwhelmed by sort of the world out there of climate change and, you know, where do you even begin? So I sort of say begin at home and you can begin, if you read my book, it would probably help you decide where you fit in, you know, where your values fit in. If you care most about climate change, here's where you would start. If you care most about, you know, indoor air quality, there's a whole chapter on that. I love that. That's perfect. What about water? Water's such a hot topic these days. And I know that, you know, people are using plastic like crazy. And in the homes, you know, the cities are testing water. And I think a lot of the city waters all over the country are not testing very well. What are your recommendations on water? Yeah. Thoughts on water? So that's a great question. So in the For Your Health section is the first one in my book. And the first tip is to filter your water. That is my number one tip for having a more healthy home. We drink water, we use it in soups and teas and coffee. We bathe in it, Mm -hmm. so we breathe in the steam, we wash our clothes in it. I mean, our bodies are made up of, you know, a high percentage of water. So, and a lot of people don't know what is in their water, Mm -hmm. Um, but we are pretty blessed here in the U.S. with having pretty clean water come to our tap for pretty inexpensively, uh, for a pretty low cost. A lot of people don't know that water from our tap costs on average a half a penny a gallon. Which is crazy. (laughs) So it's really inexpensive. So if you are drinking your eight cups of water a day, which is sort of the conventional, you know, wisdom of how much water you need every day, that water will cost you less than a dollar a year. I mean, you compare that to people buying bottled water, you will save a lot of money if you're drinking your own water. And you'll also save a lot on waste. The statistic of plastic bottles that humans are recycling something like 1 million plastic bottles every second. And oh, most yeah. of it is not recycled. A lot of it winds up in the ocean. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes circular because scientists have discovered tiny plastic particles in the fish we eat. Yes. And in whales. Oh. And I mean, they're finding it all over. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I say filter your water, it's really, it's under for your health to get the contaminants out of the right. water so that you can drink your own water and know that you're not contaminating your body. But you also save money by not purchasing bottled water. And then you'll also save a lot of waste by not you know, putting those bottles into the garbage. Yes, yes. But so what though, can you maybe expand a little bit more on like the contaminants? So what could be in those contaminants that could be harmful for us? And what are maybe some of the not side effects, but maybe something that you would notice because of the contaminants in your water or? Yeah, so some of the contaminants you can taste, I mean, chlorine is one that you can taste that's added to water, um, you know, to make it um, cleaner. But um, we filter our water to get the chlorine out because I think that that tastes bad. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to ingest it. That's not something that is healthy. The, The, you know, federal guidelines basically, you know, are met by most water municipalities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is very, very low parts per million of other stuff in the water. So things that you can find are lead, benzene, arsenic. Um, I don't have the whole list yeah, right no, now, no but yeah. there are a lot of things that can be in your water. And actually, if you go to your own um, water provider's website, they're required to list yes, yep. what you have in there. Um, and I actually have that in my book about what Minneapolis water is. And so it, it, the Minneapolis water meets federal guidelines, but there's health guidelines that are often a little 
more strict. And mm -hmm. so your water might not meet that. So the different options are a whole house water filtration system, which can get out chlorine and a lot of the contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also water filtration systems for drinking water. And that's what I'm mostly talking about mm -hmm. for your health. Yeah. There are, what we have is a RODI system. It's a reverse osmosis deionizer. So that gets out everything. They want it to get down to zero parts per million of any contaminants. And I wow. have it now too because of you. <laughs> and we love it. Do you love it? That's yeah. great. Yeah. So I think the water tastes better. You know that there's nothing else in there. Um, there are other filtration systems that are less expensive, you know, that where you don't have to do it, um, have an installation. Um, there's Brita water filters that so can So I was going to ask you, like, let's say you don't have the funds to put in a an RO, it's RO, right? An RO system. Right. Mm -hmm. So is Brita sufficient? So Brita will take out, I believe, the chlorine and okay. the chlorine taste, but it's not going to take out a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. What I recommend to people is to get a little TDS tester. They're about 10 or $15 on Amazon, I think, and it will tell you how many total dissolved solids or parts per million that is there, that is present, that's anything other than pure H2O. So you can test your water and see what's there. And if you have somebody to come over and is trying to sell you a water filtration mm -hmm. system, make sure they test your water before and after. Mm -hmm. If they don't, I wouldn't trust what they're doing because they're not showing you the outcomes, mm -hmm. right? They're not showing you the success. right? Okay. So is the goal to be at zero? For me, that's the goal. So this is controversial too, because a lot of people say, well, you're pulling out all the good things out like of water. The fluoride. The fluoride. Yes. The fluoride. Yes. Which that's is very controversial. controversial. Yes. The fluoride is controversial. I have a sort of inset text box in my book because it's such a controversial uh -huh. topic. Okay. And I went into a lot of research and found some primary research of papers, you know, done by the American Dental Association. And Fluoride is touted as one of the top 10 public health wins, successes of the 20th century because it did so much to reduce tooth decay. <laughs> There's a whole lot to go down that path in fluoride. Um, for me, I wanted it out. I think we can get fluoride through our dentists and through toothpaste. So um, same with other minerals that people say, oh, you know, well, you're, you're pulling out all of the beneficial minerals right. out of water. Mm -hmm. Well, the way to look at it is that there's not a technology that can pull out the bad stuff but leave the good stuff. You have to just pull out everything. That would be amazing. Okay. Wouldn't it? That new. Yes. How oh does gosh, it know? That would be amazing. <laughs> someday, someday. Yes, that's new business idea. Someday, identify the good things. Yes, yeah, right. pull out the bad. Same with food, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, if you are lacking in certain minerals, I think you can get a lot from food and vitamins and things like that. And you guys probably know more about that than I do. So have you just out of curiosity heard of the Berkey filter? Have you heard of that system? Uh, no. Okay. That's another water filtration filtration system that I've heard a lot about. I don't know if you have I have too. Well. I, I mean, I know it keeps getting and, popped up on my Instagram yeah. and Facebook feed because I clicked on something one time. So, um, But there's a lot out there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's overwhelming for people. Like they'll say, oh, I want I want cleaner water, but I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be overwhelming. I mean, I do recommend the reverse osmosis deionizer. So ROs without the deionizer may not get everything out. And so the RODI is something that we've lived with for a long time. And I recommended it to a lot of people. I don't get compensated for that, so I, I do really like that system. And okay. then you only need to change the filters once a year. Okay. Right. So, you know, what about the filters that are on our fridge? Like a lot of the fridges have water that comes out, right? Water and ice. Mm -hmm. And there's a filter in there, and I just know it tells us to, like, replace the filter and, you know. So, like, if you if, have a system, like what she's talking about, put, put into your home. Yeah they were able to hook up that system to my fridge. So the ice and the water coming through there are actually going through the system first. Right. I mean, I'm just curious, though, what's being filtered out of that versus... Out of the just refrigerator what the, Like you have like what the city mm. will do, baseline, right, to right. be considered safe. And then you have these other filters that are part of the fridge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it more than Brita? I don't know. So... It's probably very brand dependent, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Right. And then that's only your drinking water. So that's not the water you're using <clears> to <throat> bathe yourself, and it's mm -hmm. probably not the water you're using to cook with. 
when you're boiling foods and which I've been reading a lot about like eczema and all these like skin mm-hmm. issues that people are having that when they put these um, filtration systems you know in their showers like you can buy even on Amazon like a special shower mm-hmm. I don't know if you have anything like that a shower head that filters out some of that stuff and your shower water is very clean mm-hmm. yeah that's a great no, low cost way to filter uh-huh. out your shower water your the chlorine out of the, your shower so because that can be really irritating. kind of damaging irritating. and irritating mm-hmm. to your skin and to your hair so those things you can just unscrew your shower head and put the other one back on and some of them are low flow too so you'll be saving money on your water as well as your energy bill because you're using less hot water mm. So you three in one. So much, <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, I really like my high pressure hot shower. <laughs> like, it's not good, but I do. I would say the, the the ones that have lower flow don't mean low pressure because oh. they're, it's oh. an aerator. It mixes with air, and it can actually feel a lot higher pressure. Oh, I did not. I did know not know that. that either. Yeah, so it's because That's I get really that pushback. Yeah, because people think, oh, I don't want to sacrifice that. I understand that you want your yeah, good shower, right? right? But it's more water does not necessarily mean more pressure. It's the pressure, and so you can have lower flow shower heads that still feel really strong. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Because John, if you're listening to this, this is the argument. <laughs> we don't have an argument to change out the shower head. Because that's what he meant. Yeah, well, that's said. me too. I like always think about it. And then I'm like, oh, but I just don't want to give up my nice shower. Right. Right. Well, maybe we can do a test and get back yes, there. There we go. We'll idea. have a part two. We'll, yeah. we'll have you back on again. Um, so a couple of things, and I know you've peppered them in throughout this conversation, but for our listeners, you know, what are your top three recommendations that you could start doing today, tomorrow, this week to just have a more sustainable home without going in and doing, you know, a LEED certification mm-hmm. or anything like that. Or building a new or, house. Yeah, building <laughs> a new house, right. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a couple of really easy things to do, um, which I'm sure you've heard the tips, like change out your light bulbs to LED bulbs. I mean, they are a financial no-brainer. Mm-hmm. Right. People often wait until their own, if they have incandescent lights or even compact fluorescent lights, they wait till, you know, they... Uh, burn out and I say don't wait you know it may feel wasteful to throw away a perfectly good incandescent bulb but you're being more wasteful by using it so change it out as soon as you can because you're saving energy and you won't have to change it out probably for years and years because they last a whole lot longer so that's a really easy thing to do another easy thing on the topic of saving water not just on your shower, but on your faucets. There's little faucet aerators that you can get at Home Depot. Um, they're really inexpensive, and um, you can change out your faucet and say, and it will reduce your water flow from about two and a half gallons per minute down to you know one and a half, one point two. You can go down to zero point five, and that's actually required for commercial buildings. Is getting down to zero point five for for lead in some places that have uh, less you know, water abundance. I mean, in Minnesota, we have a lot of water, but some places like California and Colorado, they require them to do that. So that's an easy thing that you'll save money on your water bill as well as on your energy bill if you're using less less hot water. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So those are sort of easy things to do. I mean, if you have an old um, older home that is uh, leaky and drafty and you have very high energy bills, the number one thing I say, especially in Minnesota, is to do, get an energy audit. You can call up Excel Energy, and their lower cost one is $30, and they'll do a walkthrough with you. But if you can at all afford the $60 one, they'll do an infrared scan of your walls. And you'll want to do it when it's colder outside than inside, you know, when there's a big enough temper, temperature differential. And they'll show you where you may have insulation that's missing. Because yeah. you can't see behind your walls. Right. But I can tell you, every person I know and every you know contractor I know, when they pull out walls, there are places your insulation is missing. And so you're losing energy, you're losing heat, and you're paying for that. I feel like my house has that issue. Like we have high energy bills, and I feel drafts in certain if places. If you feel drafts, right. So there could be some easy, low-cost things to do. Um, in terms of adding insulation, you don't. It's not like a full house renovation, but an energy auditor through Excel will come show you and pinpoint that, and they'll give you the resources. They may bring a faucet aerator for free. Sometimes they do that, 
And then the other thing they do is a blower door test, which tests mm -hmm. how leaky your house is. And mm -hmm. so that will lead to recommendations around sealing and caulking around windows and doors. Okay. Um, that is so interesting. One thing we didn't talk about a little bit, just going outside of your house, we talked a lot about inside, and you have this in your book and on your website is the wildflower garden. Can you talk just for a couple minutes about that and the benefits? Yeah, so a big category of sustainability is the site and your landscape and what, what you're doing with the land around your house. So it depends on, you know, if you have a third of an acre or an acre or whatever it is, um, your landscape can have a big effect on the outdoor air quality. It can have a big effect on your, your pocketbook as well as uh, what ecological benefits um, you know, your plants have. So one of the things we did when we built our house is we wanted um, to have, we didn't want to have a big lawn. And um, if you limit the size of your lawn, you'll save money on watering it, fertilizing it and mowing it. And you'll also, the emissions from gas powered lawn equipment is really horrible. The EPA mm -hmm. estimates that an hour of running a gas-powered lawnmower is the same as 40 cars. Wow. So if you think about that, who would want 40 cars sitting on your lawn for an hour? You know, it's just, yeah. it's really bad emissions. So limiting the size of your lawn is another thing I talk about as um, a, a, a improvement or enhancement around the sustainability of your home. So, and it's not just, you know, the lawn itself doesn't really do much here or there for your health. or it, it's, it's what else it could be. So it could be trees that help with carbon sequestration, provide shade. It can help, it can be edibles. And uh, what we did a lot of is wildflowers. I started talking about when we originally built the house, um, we, instead of just wildflowers, we were sort of talked into building or um, planting a native prairie. So native grasses and wildflowers. And there was a short period of time when the daisies were blooming where it was really pretty. But overall, it was a big mess of grasses and weeds, and it was really, really hard to stay on top of it. And our landscapers kept saying, oh, well, it takes three to five years to get established, so, so just you know, wait that out. Well, we got cited by the city of Minneapolis <laughs> because we were in violation of a city, of a city ordinance because they said we weren't mowing our lawn <laughs> when we were mowing where we had lawn. Right. Um, so anyway, it, it actually was kind of a big mess and we pulled out all of the grasses and we replaced it with wildflowers. And you can do beautiful perennial, low maintenance, drought tolerant, mm -hmm. um, you know, no ir irrigation required garden of wildflowers, things that come up in the early spring. We have anem anemones that are white that are these sweet little flowers that come up early. And then the purple wild geraniums come up and then, you know, echinacea and, uh, Rudbeckia, black-eyed Susans, mm -hmm. and then the fall, there's asters. And over time, you know, they grow and they spread. And the number of bees and butterflies that come into our yard is just amazing. Yeah. And you really feel like you're doing an ecological service right. by oh, having yeah. this. And if you just can imagine if everybody took even half of their lawns and replaced them with wildflowers, mm -hmm. we would be doing a tremendous ecological service and you'd also be reducing emissions from not having to mow Whoa. half of the lawn. Which is I something I didn't I did not know, know that. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, so that's a big one, you know, whether it's hard or easy or expensive. I mean, you know, it can be expensive if you hire somebody to do it and they bring in full-grown plants. But it can be really inexpensive if you just buy wildflower seeds and you plant right. them. Right, right. That's a great oh, idea. Great idea. I want to try I'm, that next year. Yes. A patch of lawn. We have a lot of lawns, so... Let take a little patch of lawn and yeah, try little it out at a time. and see how it goes. Yeah. It's a great idea. Oh, I love that. So much good information. <laughs> so um, as we wrap up, we always like to ask our guests, what does the art of living well mean to you? The art of living well. It, it, I love that question because it is sort of an art. There's no mm -hmm. science. There's not one answer. And it can change over time. And I think it can change over different seasons. And for me, living in Minnesota, that for sure does change with the seasons. And a lot of it, a lot of the art of living well is actually being in touch with the seasons and being in touch with sort of what's going on outside in, in your body and what your body needs. If you need sleep, if you need exercise, you know, what kind of food you put into your body, mm -hmm. drinking water, all of that stuff. It's sort of a balance of, you know, what you do with your time and making sure that it 
you know, I, I require some intellectual stimulation <laughs> every day. Mm -hmm. um, require, you know, the, not require, but I would like to have interaction with other people, feeling that my work is meaningful, um, but also taking care of my own body is really important. Oh, I love that. Great answer. Yes, yeah, great answer. Really beautiful answer. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We're very excited to share everything that you, we talked about with our listeners. And if people want to find you, buy your book, check out the resources that you have, can you tell everyone where they can track you down? Yeah, so I have a website. It's You can go to um, www.buildingasustainablehome.com. That's the name of my book. The website is also green-intention.com. So that's the name of my company. So you can find me on that website. Um, my book, you can you know click through on the website to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or independent bookstores. My book is also available if you go directly to Amazon or Barnes & Noble on the web. Um, I also um, work with a company called Rise, and their website is www.buildwithrise.com. And it's a great platform for learning more about renovating and uh, you know improving your home more sustainably. So I'm the editor of that site, and we put out an article every day about tips and advice or home features um, or in-depth product guides, and there's really a lot of great um, resources there. I wish they had been there when I renovated or when we built our home, and the founder of the company actually said the same thing about my book. He wished my book had been available <laughs> when he renovated his home. So it sounds like a great match. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And are you on Facebook and Instagram? Yeah, so on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash building a sustainable home. And then my Instagram account is just green intention. Okay, great. Singular. So, well, you are doing amazing work. Thank We're lucky you. To have you. Thank you yes. so much. Um, the world is, will be a better place. Yeah, this is super of what you're doing. important yeah. information. So I'm really glad you're getting it out there. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share. Absolutely. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Hey, Stephanie. Um, I have been thinking about how I have switched my products um, in my bathroom to safer, cleaner ingredients because, you know, over the last few years, I've noticed that I've had a lot of skin rashes and itchy eyes. And as I've become more and more educated about um, all of the chemicals in our products that we use, I've noticed that everything's kind of cleared up in my skin. And I just am so excited about this. And I want to share this with everybody else. And I want everybody to know about cleaner, safer, you know, beauty products and personal care products. I know. I feel exactly the same. And I think it's, it can be intimidating and very overwhelming at first because just like when you start reading labels on, of your food, some of the ingredients don't look familiar. You can't pronounce them. It's similar with beauty and personal care. And honestly, I think it's more confusing because there are many ingredients that just we don't recognize and doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe or not. But and also when you're when you're buying like a high end brand, you think that it's going to be this high quality product. And it never really crossed my mind that, wow, like they're putting all kinds of junk in these products. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a big misnomer, right? Because you're paying mm -hmm. for the brand, you're paying a lot of money, you're paying for the packaging, and you assume it's safe. But unfortunately, no one in the U.S. is regulating what ingredients companies put into these products. So Marnie and I are offering this great online workshop coming up on April 22nd. It'll run from 9.15 a.m. Central Time, but it'll all be virtual. You'll get all the materials and recording after, so no worries if you can't make it. So from 9 to 10.15 Central Time. Yes, and you can sign up on our website, which is just www.theartoflivingwell.us slash programs. And we're going to dive into this in way more detail, and um, it'll be interactive. So if you have some products that you're wondering, if are they safe, are they not? And maybe also, Marnie, you can talk about like what, um, what we're going to do in the workshop. Bring those products with you virtually, and you can show them if you can make it to the live, to the live yeah. version. And we're going to talk about um, reading ingredient labels and how do you sift through that information, and we're going to talk about the effects um, some of these chemicals have on our bodies. And also, Stephanie and I recorded a wonderful episode on our podcast, episode 21, that's all about 
um, clean beauty and personal care products. And if you want to go listen to that as a little precursor to the workshop, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so we so, hope you can join us. Um, message us if you have any questions and just head on over to our website to sign up. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.